Once again, Dan McNeil. This session, we're going to make a candlestick. Uh, it represents techniques that I learned from a number of different people. Uh, Rob Gunter demonstrated a lot of hollow forming one year here at this conference and uh, did chili peppers and all kinds of things. Well, this candle cup and the tooling I use is what I learned from him. Uh, I, I just can't recall everything I know uh, to tell you. That was from yesterday. That's what Francis used to say. Um, anyway, we'll just get going. Uh, and I'm going to start with the base. Not that you have to start with the firm foundation, but uh, the base has a hole drilled in it, so I don't want it to be hot when I go over to the drill press. So I'm going to forge this first and then do the stem and uh, the rest of the stuff. Quarter inch by three. To cut a circle with oxyacetylene torch, which is what I have, uh, it's always a challenge, you know, you try to get around a circle. Well, then when I came and was at my master class with Francis, he showed me his cutting table, which was over there earlier, that you release the bolt and it spun around so smoothly. It's like, why does it spin around? Well, he had a fit up for the cutting torch where the cutting torch fit into this little bracket, which was a center point, And then the torch head would be the outside part of the trammel as you were making the, or the divider of the compass as you were making the circle. Well, you wouldn't turn the torch around. You would lay the metal down with a center punch mark and spin the table as you were holding the torch. And you'd get perfect circles every time. And if you do it at the right speed and you've got the right torch settings, you get very little slag buildup whatsoever. Uh, these are ground a little bit more. Yeah, this is a similar setup. I practiced over lunch. No switch to turn it off. I talked a lot about a coal fire the last demo. Um, one of the questions that came up afterwards was how do you identify the different things I was talking about? And so over here, I've got a chunk of coal, coke, much lighter weight than the coal, clinker, and fly ash. I couldn't put any of the smoke on here. It just didn't want to stay. But those are the byproducts, is the clinker, the fly ash, and the smoke from burning coal. Hard to identify the difference between clinker and coke in the fire until you've gotten used to it. So just practice.
Some people like to use every pot in the kitchen. I like to use every tool in the shop. Well, besides to be funny, um, I used that one because it has drawing dies because I wanted to draw the edge of this down a little thinner around here. Um, and I felt I could do that a little smoother and better with the drawing dies. Dan, will you get your sledgehammer again? Your striking hammer? Do now what will be harder to do later. Hard. There's these cut off bells over there in the driveway that I brought. They're for sale. They're really good for uh, sinking into different sizes. The bigger ones don't jump around as much. A flat surface is really good to work on. Okay, I can't do this on the floor of my wood uh, uh, floor of my dirt shop. But my big steel table is closer to my anvil. Come on, come on, come on, come on. There you go. So, there we go. It's domed so that it will sit without rocking. That's why I did it on the flat. Also, so there's room for the rivet on the bottom. I made sure that my touch mark was put in not in the dead center where I'm going to drill my hole. Something's burning in there, man. Oh, it's, so hot. Ah, it's the sweet aroma of roasting chilies. I, I have a chili roaster in my shop, and the falling off of the chili roasting gets uh, on the table. And if I don't clear off the table, then when I put a piece of hot iron on it, it fills the shop again with this wonderful aroma of roasting chilies. But so it's not a distraction, I'll put this down on the floor. <laughs> it's the sweet aroma. So. Because we're doing this power hammer stuff, we'll now do the candle cup. No, not the candle cup, the, this part right here. I'll pass this around just because I can. Most of the things I make, I saw somebody else do. Because there is nothing new under the sun. This particular assemblage, even though I learned techniques from various people, I could say that I didn't copy this from some other smith. I came up with this design on my own. Uh, not that that's any great shakes, but uh, 
I'm proud of it. And it's something that you can't get somewhere else. And so I like to give this as wedding gifts to uh, young couples. Uh, pairs, of course. Francis used to have a switch over here to turn on his power hammer. So that by the time he got to the power hammer, it was already going. I can understand why in a school you wouldn't want to do that. In my own shop, I haven't set up a three-way switch because a three-way 20 amp switch, which is what my power hammer takes with the motor I've got and all, uh, is more expensive than I wanted to put in and the wiring for just, you know, click it on and get started. I don't find it's a problem. Notice my posture. My foot's way back. You always want to have really stable position with your body when you're doing something, especially with a piece of machinery. If I was standing with my toes touching, my heels together, like I'm in chair position or something, you know, it's, that's a yoga thing. Um, it wouldn't be very stable. It's much better to be, you know, warrior pose. So there's a lot of tools. Sometimes you can have too many tools. We heard Steve talking about how he only took some of his tongs down to his new shop and he hardly ever went back to get more of them. But sometimes I feel like you can make the mistake of the shopsmith, which is supposed to be the one piece of equipment that does everything and it doesn't do anything very well. I'm fiddling around with this to make sure that it gets even heat all the way around because the next step is to be to sink Show that to the camera.
So what I'm doing there is, don't touch the hot part. Um, I've got this little tool down at the bottom that I'm sinking into. I had to make this for this demo because the piece that I normally use is an 85 pound block of steel with a hole in the middle of it, but I didn't want to take that with me. Uh, and I'm sinking this piece into it with a blunt round nosed punch. Mild steel. Mild steel, mild steel, mild steel. The reason you'd want to have alloy steels is because of some reason that mild steel doesn't work. Mild steel is cheaper, easier to forge, easier to make. If you lose it, what the heck? Uh, but on a sharp edge, point your camera over there on that board. On a sharp edge, the sharp edge can fold and deform when it gets hot, and the thinner section gets hot faster when it engages the hot metal. So a slitting chisel needs to be of a, of a material that won't deform when it gets in contact with the hot metal. We talked, heard a lot this weekend about H13. Great hot cutting material, hot working material for that kind of a chisel. The hot cut hardy is shaped more like this. And it doesn't have to be of the super high hot working material as the H13. It could be, but H13 is really expensive, especially in a great big old chunk like you'd get for your hardy tool. You could use a piece of jackhammer bit. Very good tool for a jackhammer bit. We've heard about butchers. A butcher has a straight cutting side and an angled cutting side. The angle could be different angles. I mean, it could be that kind of an angle or this kind of an angle. We've also heard about fullers. And a fuller makes a round indentation in the metal. This is the fuller end of the, a fuller peen or a round peen or a straight peen, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's a round, it's doing the job of a fuller. A fuller usually isn't on a hammer. It's something that you pound into. Don't hammer a hammer face, but uh, you're making the round part go into the metal. Later, I'm gonna use a swage, but since I'm over here, I'll talk about this, which is when I wanna make a tenon, which will be a round bolt sticking out of the end of my piece, I will use something that's shaped like this, kind of like lips, you know, pursed lips. Uh, that's the shape that's in my dies that I'm gonna use uh, when I do the tenon. Yesterday we saw Gordo using a tool in the treadle hammer uh, that basically did the same thing. Uh, Miner shaped just a little bit differently and I'll use them pretty much the same way Gordo did. Don't touch the hot part. So I'm starting out with a piece of 3 8 inch square, 17 inches long. I want to make this to end up being about 24 inches. That's 12. That's about 24. It might end up being 23, but I'm going to make it about that long in two different processes. I'm going to take part of it and forge it into this part, and another part of it and forge it into that part. I'm going to do this part first.
If you get coal that's great big chunks of coal, knock them down so they're smaller, like this, where you've got some, like, you know, little chunkies, but pea size, and the fines are really good. The fines and the water you put on it all helps it kind of clump together to form the coke. I was looking over there because my water is on that side of my forge. Well, actually, I'm on this side of my forge and the water's here. My goal is to forge this from this point. How long is that? Well, I'm just going to guess. Because I don't really know, but it's organic. It doesn't really matter. Organic shapes. I, it, you'll see so many scrolls in Yellen's work. Uh, yes, very accurate, a lot of stuff. But if you look at the scroll work within a grill, oftentimes you'll see that the scrolls are all a little bit weird and wonky because scroll work, you can expand and contract so that they meet at the right place, but the scroll itself gives you a lot of adjustment. No, right, can't turn it on. Just walk up to it. want to turn it off. Very nice smooth taper is what I got there, but I wasn't able to get it down quite pointy enough here for what I wanted, so that's what I'm going to do next. Notice my left hand as I'm forging. It's working just as much as my right hand. It's positioning. When you're doing a scroll, never hit the scroll in the same place twice when you're adjusting the scroll, right? I'm pretty close to length right now. This would be a little bit longer than normal. Is that 24? Yeah, that's 24. Mm -hmm. 
I said before, I don't quench unnecessarily. However, it was necessary this time so that I could hold on to it. The forge is not a coal bin. So I don't have to have a mountain of coal here all around falling off on the floor. I could have a mound here, and as I push in the green coal, it forms coke. And I'm working with it in the center of the forge. I'm not pointing my piece down like that into the bottom of the forge because it doesn't have any fuel underneath it. It's not going to get hot very fast. If it's in the center of the fire with fuel below and fuel above, it'll get hot faster. Next thing I'm doing, I want about nine inches. Is that a nine? No, that's a nine. Did you hear the cadence of the machine? It wasn't an even striking each time. It was sometimes a little harder, sometimes it was a little off. Uh, you get used to each machine the more you use it. And I mean, that wasn't me making it do that. It's just how the machine is. But you get used to your machinery, and sometimes your machinery, your tooling, really helps determine certain characters of your work. Of course, somebody who's using a great big hammer could be making huge old hunking me you know, metal do things that you can't possibly do with just hand hammers. My work is human scaled. It's whatever I can lift. You know, so it goes down from small stuff to something that's, you know, doors that I can lift and carry around in the backyard, uh, sculpture that, you know, I can not, knock my, not, not my back out. I, I don't want to wreck my back trying to lift it. But uh, I don't do stuff that's, you know, 80 feet high and 1,000 feet long. But I'll attempt stuff that I can carry around. I don't have a forklift. Sometimes wish I'd have cement floor in a forklift, but then who doesn't want 15,000 square feet and a whole lot of equipment? It's a lot to maintain. It's a big responsibility. So here I'm just smoothing out 
some of what the power hammer was doing for me. And even though it's organic and, you know, it can be a little irregular, I mean, this is not a machined product. This is a handmade forged product. I want it to be sort of smoother than what the big power hammer was giving me just now. So, nine inches brings me down to here. 24 inches brings me to there. See? So I've taken my 17 inches and I made it nine inches here. And at that point, I'm gonna mark with a hot cut at the nine inches. I'm going to use that mark later, but I wanted it there now. Now I'm going to upset and put a tenon on that end. So when I go to upset, did I point out clinker? Yeah, I did that. When I go to do a tenon here, I'm going to upset first on the end so that this gets a little bit thicker. So right there is a little bit thicker. Upsetting, hammering that way, making it short and fat. This was all new terminology the first time I came to a conference. Upset, draw. It's like, what are they talking about? It's like you could name your cats that. Upset and draw. Some people you'll see upset here. That's really hard on the cartilage in your wrist. And Francis's wrist wore out. So he was always going on about how use the vise, whatever can use the vise. Use the anvil when you can use the anvil. Don't wear out your wrist when you don't need to. Now I will use butcher dies yeah butcher dies I usually use these in a treadle hammer at home but I think it's going to be easier for the camera to see what I'm doing if I'm doing it here And my butcher dies are also shaped like pursed lips with a little bit of curve at the top and a little bit of curve at the bottom. on here. Those two. 
Okay, put them in that way. So, can you see that? It's about a quarter of an inch that I poached out there on that upset end of a three, three eighths inch. I put it in on the diamond, and I'm really aware of where the shoulder is on this side. So I want to keep my shoulder as square as I can and as sharp as I can as I'm bringing this down. And I'm turning it as I go. And it has stretched out that far. So it's now it's about a half an inch. But it's not quite there. What size tenon is it? A quarter inch? It's a quarter inch tenon. I could do this in one heat, multiple processes, especially since I could run over to the treadle hammer and do this, that, and the other thing. This just isn't as big as the treadle hammer. I don't know what's wrong. This is a monkey tool. used to square up the shoulder on a tenon. The end of my tenon was sticking out beyond and didn't get quite small enough. So I'm going to reswage just the end of the tenon so that I can come over and use the monkey tool on it. Because the monkey tool, even though it has a little bit oversized quarter inch hole and radius edges on the inside, so it's not a super sharp edge, but it's Still pretty square. These don't roll off the table with the square edges on them. This little square block. Nice and heavy. Big. So that if you're doing a bunch of them, they don't heat up very quick. soft jaws of aluminum in the vise so that the vise jaws don't affect my work. I turn the monkey tool as I'm using it, as I'm upsetting that edge a little bit, getting it kind of square in there, square shoulders. 
I find it's easier to look at it when I'm down like this rather than pounding like this. I can see my work better. I'm using the smaller hammer because I don't need to move a large mass. That end is now ready to be cut off and tapped for quarter 20, which we'll do later. Now we're going to take here where I made my mark, heat it up, bend it, forge weld it into this part, upset and put a tenon on that to go into the base. Yes. So the hole in the monkey hole, is that oversized? A little bit, because you've got hot material that's in it, and it's expanded, and so it needs to be a little bit bigger for the expansion of the hot material. Dan, Dan, nibbling. How much bigger is a hole for a piece of hot metal to go in of a certain dimension? What's the coefficient of expansion? I knew you'd have the answer. Okay, cut halfway through, bend it around. Brush off scale. A different style of tongs. Okay, this is what we did this morning. Whole different style for a different purpose. I'm using it there because I'm holding over the upset. Wire brush the scale. To flux in the fire or not in the fire. To use easy weld or borax. How about if I flux near the fire with borax? Jim Martin, a national treasure of Britain while he was alive. I saw him demonstrate in California. He would forge weld with the sand that he picked up down at his local place in Scotland. What an amazing guy. Don't use my big forging hammer. 
Use my smaller hammer for the forge weld. Get the heat farther up than where your weld is. So if your weld's gonna be here, make sure your heat is farther up. I don't really wanna reduce the material too much right now. I want it to stick together. Prepare your next step. Don't get there and then fix it. Adjust it before you need it. As you walk across the shop, be adjusting the vice grips for the size you need. I'm not obsessive compulsive. Now I'm going to upset this a little bit. How long is the fish you caught? The treadle hammer I use for this is a swing arm, like that one.
So there's an action with the treadle hammer that even though it looks like it should be coming down, you can tell I didn't rehearse this part beforehand. Which way is release on this? There we go. Pull it this way. Really hard. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. It'll do it. And then it goes up. I want it to go up. Will it go up? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, it'll just have to do for where it is. Oh, pull that over back that way. Pull this over back that way. Okay, before I got interrupted by the treadle hammer, the treadle hammer pulling down doesn't have a straight down motion, even though it's pretty close. It has a pulling back motion as well, which has deformed my blacksmith's helper. But back to my use every tool in the shop thing. Um, That's going to be a 3 8 tenon. 3 8 tenon. I have my dies marked. Even though I can measure them, I can see where they're stamped. You get nice, just, you get really good imprints with the punches when you do the metal hot and it sinks in there. Looks great, I think. Okay, you can hear it start to hit bottom there. Turning the monkey tool. I'm not using my huge hammer. I just want to upset a little bit of mass there. When your kids come into your shop, you know everybody's going to have little kids come in the shop. Don't let them play with this and get their finger pinched in there. That really hurts. Don't pick it up. Okay. Now, we've got the stem. We've got this part here. We've got that little part up there.
I think what I'll do next is I'll curl this around, which means I want to hold on to it down there. Okay, okay, can somebody bring me one of Francis's tong clips? Is there a smaller version of this? I haven't seen it. Gordo, you haven't seen a smaller version? Here's one. Oh, great. Thanks. When you curl a scroll, you want to do the very tip end first. When you're getting the scroll that goes on the inside, the tip end on the very inside is the hardest part to get. Now, I don't know if this scroll would be harder or easier to get whichever end I started with first, but because that's what I learned, that's what I'm going to start with. I like the coal fire because you can get a localized heat where you want it, more or less. If you really want a localized heat, use the torch. But as opposed to a gas forge where uh, you got a lot going on. It's like the glory hole, you know, over here in the glass studio.
What I'm looking for here is the height of the handles. Just because, you know, a pair of candle holders ought to be the same height. Though I have, you know, for somebody who's really tall and somebody else who's really short, giving them candle holders that are really tall and really short as a pair, um, that's not generally what I do. I mean, I don't do anything generally, actually. Uh, being in the theater for so long, I'm really used to doing things one thing at a time. One, like, like never any production run. Anything we would do is art and prototype. And by the time I did it the second time, I was on to like, okay, let's do something else. And always improving it. So I was never good at running shows, but I was the guy who was kind of figuring out how to invent whatever we did next. You've got a dominant eye, and you got to figure out what your dominant eye is because that's the eye that you look at when you're sighting down on something. And okay, don't get too personal, but my dominant eye used to be my right eye until now my left eye is dominant because I can see clearer out of it. So this is. Hot finished at this point. Because it's hot and I want to put a finish on it, I'm going to melt beeswax into it. Now, this beeswax is kind of white. I don't know why. Maybe it came from an art store and it was clarified and uh, most beeswax is yellow. Does it smell like beeswax? Yeah. I think it smells more like beeswax than paraffin. The beeswax will melt in. It'll burn off. I'll wipe it off with a rag in a minute. Don't get beeswax all over the floor of your shop. Oh, or on your anvil. Um, I usually do this over a uh, cardboard box and I stay upwind of it because no matter what the smoke, you don't want to inhale it. Went to the hospital, uh, I asked the nurse, uh, you know, about prescription medical marijuana. And she said, inhaling anything is bad for you. Of course, I was joking. Remember what I said about don't touch the hot part? Well, keep yourself away from it. Okay, so that's the hot part right there. Next steps are to drill this piece over here. Hmm? Yeah, chili pepper pizza right here. Yes. So I have a hole there. And I have a hole here. They already have center punches in them. That's because I use the center punch when cutting it out with a torch. Vice grips with copper brazed in for the jaws so that 
it doesn't mar the steel, the iron. I call it iron. Sounds better. Well, I used to have a center punch mark in there. Does the copper show up when you patina it later? Yes, patina a different color tone. Ah, that could be to your advantage. Yeah. When you center punch for something that's hot in the forge, I like to center punch when I center punch for something hot in the forge. I like to do it with a diamond shape, a, a pyramid shaped center punch. Because the pyramid shows up better in the forge, in the hot. Okay, can you get this over here, the camera? This is a high-tech drilling operation. This is a drill press. I'm drilling with larger than a 3 8 inch. So what's larger than a 3 8 inch? Well, 3 quarter inch is larger than a 3 8 inch. But that's not a 3 quarter. This is just a little bit larger than a 3 8 inch. I'll get it. When I was in high school, I made the awful mistake. Well, of course, you know, it was the first time I'd ever used a drill press. So whose mistake was it that I was unsupervised using a tool for the first time. But uh, the piece of sheet metal spun around and I wasn't holding it with pliers or anything and it almost sliced off my thumb. So always hold your stuff in the drill press. In fact, it's always a good idea to have your stuff secure whatever you're doing to it. Like your body, you stand where you're not going to fall over. I think my drill bit is a 64th, possibly a 32nd oversized from the uh, three eighths that's there. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put it onto that, like that. I'm sorry. What? Was I sleeping when you made the candle cup? That was the very beginning, the very first thing I did. Actually, I did that just two minutes ago, and you must have just, you know. <laughs> I learned a long time ago, you don't sit where the camera sees you through the demonstration, as, you know, after lunch, it's sometimes hard to stay awake. I know, I already put a finish on it, and I'm putting it back in the fire, but I just have to heat up the end where that tenon is. My soft jaws are marked. At home, my jaws are a little bit different, so I've got a square on this one and a circle on this one, for the square on that part and the circle on this part. It tells me which way it goes here.
I'm giving it some good downward force with my left hand so that it doesn't jump out like that. When I'm striking it. Now, I could hit it really hard and make it land up in your lap, but that wouldn't be too nice. So, take these fine pickup tongs and twist off the end and put it where I'm not going to step on it. So, how long is that? Maybe it's, oh, about, yeah, let's just call it an even 11 sixteenths. Thank you. I was going to do an object lesson with all oil. I might do it later. Always pull when you've got a vise that you're closing and hot metal. I didn't think I'd be doing anything loud. So I took out my ear protection. Now I'm sad. If you're pushing and you have hot metal in there, if you slip, your face goes into the hot metal. That's why you pull to tighten the vise when you've got hot metal. Eh, not too bad. How am I doing for time? And we're over at 3? We're over at 2.45. And it's 2.40, so I have five minutes. Woo! We'll do the tapping afterwards. I spent all that time making a little tong clip and it disappeared on me. Yes, that's the one I'm looking for. Thanks. My object lesson with the oil is oil the threads on your post vise. Oil your power hammer if you've got a little giant. Oil things that move. Lubrication makes things work better. So this is a guillotine tool that I saw Rob Gunter use first.
Nope, won't fit in there. Candle cup here. I'm flaring the candle cup. That is three quarter inch, schedule 40. Non-galvanized. With a welded seam on the inside. So black pipe, sometimes called gas pipe. Pardon me? Earplugs? Earplugs, well, sure. Where he talks about how a whole bunch of lighter blows with a lighter hammer are just as effective as heavy blows with a heavier hammer. Slower. Now, I want the hole on the inside of this to get to be a number seven. Because I'm going to tap it with a quarter 20. I think I got it down to like a number 13. But it'll be okay. So, there is the candle cup. Too hot. There is oh! gravity. It's your best friend, it's your worst enemy. There we go. So when this cools down just a little bit, I'll put some more wax on it and then wipe it down. Um, when this cools down, I'll cut it with a hacksaw, drill it, tap it for quarter 20. I'll put quarter 20 threads on here. I'll put quarter 20 threads in the wavy cuppy part, which I thought was down here. Maybe I took it over there. Ah, oh, here it is. I'll put quarter 20 in here. I'll thread this down onto there. I'll screw that down onto there. I'll cut this for length so that it's sticking up in there just a little bit. And we'll have the finished. It's my tables, they went away. Who put them away? I'll have one that matches that. So, there you have it.
Well, some tools have multiple uses, and some tools are good for one purpose. I like one purpose things a lot. Uh, yesterday, Gordo had two holes in his fuller dies. Uh, I find that one hole works better for me because I can focus it in the center. It's, it's right there in the center. It, that's what works for me. Um, I like one purpose things. This, this is a one purpose thing, but it, it's got two steps to it. But the original design had a whole bunch of littler holes and they were quarter inch and uh, that, was, that was really lame because they sheared off right away. So I drilled out this one with a half inch and that's what has been working. And I see that this is now a little bit loose on the bottom. Uh, this is bolted together. I don't know why I bolted it together instead of just welding it, but um, anyway. Sometimes you see the evolution of something and you don't understand where it came from, but you just see where it has ended up. <laughs>